Hi everyone, in this video we will have a brief overview of molecular methods in microbiology. Let's first take a look at nucleic acid hybridization techniques. These techniques utilize the formation of hydrogen bonds between single-stranded or SSDNA and or RNA that are complementary to each other. These techniques usually have two components. First, we have the target or the template, and this is the nucleic acid to be identified. And this can come from a variety of sources. For example, this can come directly from a patient sample, or this can come from a secondary culture. Then we have the probe. These are labeled nucleic acids that bind to a specific target sequence. The probe detects a sequence specific to a certain microorganism or virus, and usually, the label of the probe is detectable visually or using a machine. The probe is able to attach to the target and vice versa because of complementary oligonucleotide pairs. In DNA, there are two such pairs. First, cytosine and guanine, abbreviated by C and G, and adenine and thymine, abbreviated by A and T. In RNA, thymine is replaced by uracil. So now we have adenine and uracil, abbreviated by A and U. And here we have a few examples. You can see the complementary oligonucleotide pairs. So DNA can pair with another DNA strand. DNA can also pair with RNA. And of course, RNA can also pair with another RNA strand. There are a variety of hybridization formats that we can use. First, we have the solid support hybridization. Here, target nucleic acid is transferred into a solid medium and a probe is added to detect the target. There are two main types. We have the southern blot, which detects DNA, and the northern blot, which detects RNA. Then we also have in situ hybridization. And from the name in situ, this means that the target DNA or RNA is detected by probes directly in the cell or tissue. And then we have the in-solution hybridization. This is the most common method used in laboratories. This is where targets are detected by probes in a liquid solution. And usually, this is chemiluminescence based. So you can detect the chemiluminescence either visually or using a machine. Next, let's proceed to nucleic acid amplification. The most common technique used to amplify our nucleic acid is the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. This is an in vitro technique that stimulates the in vivo DNA synthesis. And using this technique, we can detect very small amounts of DNA from bacteria by amplifying them, making them easier to detect. So there are three steps in PCR. First, we have denaturation, in which double-stranded DNA is separated into two strands. Next, we have annealing, in which primers attach to target DNA sequences. The attachment of the primer to the DNA template is an example of hybridization. These primers are so specific that they can identify bacteria up to the species and subspecies level and can even identify certain phenotypic characteristics like antibiotic resistance. The last step in PCR is extension, in which DNA polymerase synthesizes new DNA by extending the primer. And using these three steps, we can amplify our target DNA. Let's now take a look at the components of our PCR. First, you have your template DNA, which serves as the target for our PCR. This is the sequence or the portion of the DNA that you wish to amplify. Next, we have our oligonucleotide primers, and these are used to start the synthesis of new DNA strands. After, we have the thermostable DNA polymerase. This is the protein responsible for synthesizing the new strands of DNA. Then we have magnesium, which is required by DNA polymerase to function. We also have our buffer, which ensures the proper conditions and pH for the DNA polymerase. And of course, we have our deoxynucleotides, which are used by the DNA polymerase to synthesize new DNA strands. In other words, these are the building blocks of our DNA. Finally, we have our thermal cycler, 
This is the instrument that rapidly heats and cools the PCR cycle steps. Speaking of the cycle steps, we have again the three cycle steps which occur at varying temperatures. Our denaturation occurs at temperatures above 90 degrees Celsius, but usually we use the temperatures from 94 to 95 degrees Celsius. Then you have your annealing temperature, which can range from 45 degrees to 65 degrees Celsius. And usually, the temperature for annealing is optimized based on the primer sequence and lab protocols. Finally, we have our extension step, which can occur from 68 degrees to 72 degrees Celsius. Once we have finished our PCR reaction, we are left with our PCR products or our PCR amplicons. However, because our amplicons or our DNA are too small to be seen by the naked eye, we need a way to detect them. The first method is through agarose gel electrophoresis, or AGE. In this method, the PCR amplicons are loaded into a horizontal agarose gel. And on the slide, we have an example of such gel. So the PCR amplicons are loaded on the top part of the gel called the wells. Then, an electric current is passed through the gel. And because of this, negatively charged DNA will migrate from the cathode, which can be found on the top of the gel, to the anode, which is on the bottom part. As the DNA moves across the gel, they are separated by size. So larger fragments will be retained in the top of the gel, while the lower fragments will be retained in the bottom part. However, our DNA is still not visible to us, so we first have to stain them. So stains are usually already added into the gel. These stains form cross linkages or bind themselves to our DNA. And when our gels are placed under UV light, we are able to visualize our DNA that have stains attached to them. So this is a semi-quantitative way of detecting our DNA because we cannot know the true concentration of our DNA, but we are able to tell or sort of tell how much DNA is in each uh, band. So bands that are thicker will mean that there is more DNA there, and bands that are smaller means that there is less DNA. Next, we have real-time PCR, otherwise known as qPCR, or quantitative PCR. This uses fluorescent conjugated probes, which have a fluorescent dye and a quencher. A quencher is a substance that prevents the dye from fluorescing. The fluorescent dye is activated as the probe is fragmented during the extension phase. So here you can see in the figure that the probe attaches to the target DNA sequence after the primer or ahead of the primer. And as the DNA polymerase synthesizes new DNA strands, it reaches this probe. The probe is fragmented and the fluorescent dye is separated from the quencher. This separation allows the fluorescent dye to fluoresce, and this can be detected using our machines. In real-time PCR, fluorescence is directly proportional with the number of DNA copies synthesized. And because the amount of probe is limited, fluorescence can be plotted as a curve showing how much probe is used up in the reaction. As the curve flattens, this would indicate that all the probes are being used up. This allows for real-time quantification of DNA. We also have other PCR applications. Here are some examples. First, we have reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCR. This uses the enzyme reverse transcriptase to synthesize DNA from RNA transcripts. The DNA is then amplified using conventional or qPCR. RT-PCR is very useful for gene expression studies. Next, we have multiplex polymerase chain reaction or multiplex PCR. This is a PCR involving two or more targets which are detected simultaneously. These targets can either be different species or different genes. Usually, multiplex PCRs have different probes that have different colors, so they can be detected independently of each other.
Finally, we have nested polymerase chain reaction or nested PCR. This technique uses two consecutive PCR reactions in which the second reaction uses the products of the first. This produces more specific and sensitive test results. Next, let's talk about strain typing. These are a variety of techniques that differentiate different strains or species of bacteria by detecting mutations in their DNA. It achieves this by using a variety of primers or probes. In the figure, you can see different strains of Staphylococcus aureus. Observe or notice the differences or similarities in the bands between the strains. Looking closely at the figure, you can notice that lanes 1 and 5 are one strain, 2 and 3 are also another, and 4 is another one as well. And you can tell this because each strain has a unique band pattern. For this reason, strain typing is also called DNA or genetic fingerprinting. Next, we have plasmid profile analysis. This uses a similar principle with strain typing. But instead of chromosomal DNA, it uses plasmid genetic DNA instead. Now in the figure, you can see that the plasmid is actually a different genetic material from your chromosomal DNA. Now the plasmid is unique because it can easily be transferred from one cell to another and even between species. Plasmids usually contain antibiotic resistance genes. So the study of plasmids is of great importance. Next, let's talk about nucleic acid sequencing. This works hand in hand with PCR, especially when you are using nonspecific primers. Here, we determine the order of nucleotides in a given fragment of DNA. And this helps us identify or differentiate one bacteria from the other. In the microbiology section, we usually use the 16S rRNA gene to differentiate bacteria. There are many nucleic acid sequencing technologies, but we will just discuss a few. First, we have the Sanger sequencing. This uses DNTPs in very high concentrations, as well as dideoxynucleotide nucleotides, or DDNTPs, and these are chain terminating nucleotides which means that when these attach to the DNA fragment, the DNA polymerase can no longer add another nucleotide. So DDNTPs are conjugated with fluorescent dyes and appear in low concentrations. So how does Sanger sequencing work? First, DNA fragments of varying lengths are created. Again, this is because whenever a DDNTP attaches to the end of a DNA fragment, it terminates it. Next, the fragments are separated according to size. In the figure, you can see that this is done through capillary gel electrophoresis. Next, a laser or a fluorimeter detects the fluorescence in each segment and converts this into a chromatogram. In the chromatogram, whichever fluorescent dye has been detected by the laser produces a peak, and this corresponds to the terminal nucleotide. We also have other more recent nucleic acid sequencing technologies. However, you should note that Sanger sequencing is still being widely used today. The first one is pyro sequencing. This is a rapid technique used to sequence shorter lengths of DNA. In this technique, template DNA to be sequenced is immobilized in a well. Now there can be hundreds to thousands of wells, each containing their own template DNA. To the wells, Solutions of single DNTPs are added one at a time, and each time a DNTP attaches itself and extends the growing fragment, light is produced by the compound called pyrophosphate. That's why this method is called pyrosequencing. Now, whichever DNTP was in the well at the time when light was produced is considered the next nucleotide in the growing DNA sequence. We also have our next generation sequencing which is a high throughput and high accuracy method. This is usually used for whole genome sequencing. We won't discuss the specifics here, but you can look up these examples. You have your HiSeq and MySeq, your Iron Torrent, and your ABI solid.
Next, let's tackle microarrays or nanoarrays. These are small-scale nucleic acid hybridizations that are used to profile the gene expression of single or multiple organisms or cells at the same time. This method uses hundreds to thousands of probes that are attached to a solid medium. After that, target DNA, which has been conjugated with fluorescent dyes, are added and allowed to hybridize with the probes. The excess DNA is washed off and the detector detects the fluorescent signal which corresponds with gene expression. So here on the right side, you can see two examples of your microarrays. On the top portion, you can see dots with varying intensities of green color. So here the intensities correspond with the level of expression of whichever gene the probe uh, codes for, or detects for rather. On the bottom part, you can see two colors, red and green, still at varying intensities. So each color here corresponds with a different cell line, or maybe uh, this can correspond to different uh, species. And again, the intensity of the color corresponds to the expression of the gene. Next, let's talk about our proteomics. These are large-scale studies on the proteome of a cell. So the proteome of an organism is the sum of proteins found during all changing conditions for a cell. And in proteomics, the expression and interrelationships of these proteins are examined. So proteomics is actually a very complicated field on its own. And here we have an example of an E. coli proteome. Each circle that you see or each dot corresponds to a different protein. And the lines connecting them are the interactions between the various proteins. So as you can see, it's a very complicated relationship between all these proteins. Next, let's talk about Malditoff MS. This is an example of a simple proteomic study, and this stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight Mass Spectrometry. This method can be used for the rapid identification of different microorganisms, which can also include your fungi. The method works by pure colonies being placed on a metal plate. After, the colony proteins are crystallized onto the plate using a matrix solution. A laser is then used to ionize the proteins and separate them from each other. These proteins travel through a flight tube into a mass spectrometer, and the proteins are detected based on their time of flight and mass to charge ratio. The detected proteins can then be compared to a database to identify the organism in question. On this slide, you can see a more in-depth view of how the Malditoff MS works. On the top portion, you can see that we can use both primary clinical specimens and pure bacteria cultures. However, it is advisable that you use pure bacteria cultures to avoid any interfering results. On the bottom portion, you can see how the Malditoff MS works. The matrix, which contains your crystallized proteins, is found on the metal plate at the bottom of the Malditoff machine. Then, a laser is directed at the crystallized matrix, and this separates the different proteins. After, an electrical field generator accelerates these proteins into a time-of-flight tube. At the end of the time-of-flight tube, you can find a detector, which detects how long it takes for the proteins to pass through the tube and the protein's mass-to-charge ratio. This is then plotted into a graph similar to the one you see at the bottom. Each peak in this graph corresponds to a different protein or different group of proteins. The peaks can then be compared to a given database to help identify our microorganisms. Malditoff MS can be used for both antimicrobial susceptibility testing and microorganism identification. It can even be used for the subtyping of different species. Okay, so that ends our lecture. On molecular methods, please check out these references for more information on the topic.